let's see. So there's a, a new feature on that, that YouTube has where um, you can go live with with other creators. Um, and this is the first time either one of us have used it. <laughs> so we maybe if we were smart, we would have tested this out ahead of time instead of uh, just flying by the seat of our pants. So somebody asked, you know, what battlefield I'm at. Oh, here we go. Hang on. I just clicked add. Hey, there he is. Hey. 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 Working. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> I tried doing like a, a landscape view, but I it wouldn't let me. Um, yeah. It must so, be kind of like uh, how Instagram does it when Sarah yeah. does hers. looks like it's the yeah. same deal. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm guessing. It's a vertical video format. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, going live uh, from my vehicle, obviously. Uh, so for anyone who's watching, I, I live in the woods and my internet service is absolutely terrible at my house. So a lot of times it ends up being blurry. It's actually better for me to come into town and you know, go live in, in this manner. Uh, it's going to be yeah, a lot. I've got a similar problem. The hotel internet where I'm at in Charleston is awful. So I'm just using my cell phone signal. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. You're you're in you're in West Virginia, right? Yeah, I'm uh, Cross Lanes, West Virginia. It's about ten miles west of uh, Charleston. Okay, speaking engagement. Yeah, I'm uh, speaking in elementary school here tomorrow, and then driving home. I'll uh, I'll have been gone for less than twenty four hours by the time I roll back into home tomorrow. Oh dang! That's, yeah, that sounds like four a hours. that sounds like yeah. a JD. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was four four hour drive. I just been, got here about an hour ago, and then four hour drive to go home tomorrow. <laughs> All right. So, can can you see the comments on your end? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, I can okay. see them. All right. So, yeah, if anyone has questions along the way, I mean, sometimes these roll by pretty fast, and it's it's difficult to catch them, but uh, we'll we'll try and you know do our best with it. Uh, like I said, this is something new for me, um, but. Anyway, hey, uh, I've caught your first two episodes uh, from from the Western Front. Um, so I need to clear something up real quick. Yeah. Is, is it Eep or Ypres? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's actually neither one if you ask the people who live there. That's one of the oh. questions I had, too. So the spelling that people usually use, Y-P-R-E-S is the French spelling and it's pronounced like Eep or Eper, you know, Ypres, something like that, but okay. they don't speak French in that part of Belgium. So they, they speak, it's the Flemish part of Belgium. So they speak Dutch. And so on all the signs there and the way they pronounce it is it's I E P E R. It's pronounced Eper. Eper. Yeah. So that's how the, that's how the, the natives who live there pronounce it Eper. Um, but the way we always see it spelled is the French spelling, but that's not a French speaking part of Belgium. So it just, that was how it was on all the maps at the time during world war one. So that was what they went with. And of course the British, they called it wipers. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I've heard it, I've heard it pronounced. Eep. Yeah. Uh, do you listen to, have you listened to the, uh, old frontline podcast? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, and I was actually listening to Dan Carlin's podcast again on the way down here. And he okay. and he does like Ypra. That's how he says it. But it was only when I went there that I learned for sure. Definitely Ypra is what they say there. Ypra. Okay. Because yeah. on, on the front line, he, he pronounces it Eep. Mm. Um, yeah. I've heard it that way too. And I, I kind of, you'll even hear in some of my videos, I kind of bounce back and forth a little bit with it. But it was actually, I ran into a local guy and we started talking and he assured me that it's definitely Ypra is what they say there. So Okay. I'm terrible at any foreign language. <laughs> I, it's, it's the one thing that I will uh, say that, that I do well is, is mispronouncing foreign names. Um, so like the, the city that, that we all pronounce Reims. R -E -I -R -M. Rem. Yeah. Rem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah e even you just said it wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like when I was there, we, we went to Normandy and, um, 
I was telling the guy, he, he didn't speak much English, but I was telling him where we were. And I was like, Hey, we, we just came, we were in Reims last night, you know, where they signed the surrender. And he was like, huh? And I, I kept saying it and trying to describe it. So finally I wrote it down and he's like, Oh no. And, and I can't even say it right. He goes, it's wrong. And yeah. <laughs> some weird guttural sound. Um, well, and a, a lot of we get messed up because of things like Band of Brothers. They say Reams and they say Foy, but it was Foy, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, but that that the, the British like I, that's one of the things I learned in being around the Ypres Salient is you know the British had their names for all that stuff like Plug Wood was Plug Street, and you know so they would just anglicize everything to make it easier for them to say, and they almost made it into a joke the way that they did it. So, <laughs> oh, shoot. But for anybody who's who's watching this right now, uh, holy smokes, we actually got quite a few people in here. Um, so Chris uh, has got the channel vlogging from through history. Uh, we, we've done some some work together before. Uh, actually, did a collaboration on uh, Antietam series. Uh, so we kind of bounced back and forth on that. He would cover things from one angle, I would cover it from another. Um, and one one of the the big gaps on one of many big gaps, I guess you could say on my channel is, is world war one history. Uh, so if you're into world war one history, uh, Chris is definitely filling that gap <laughs> over on his channel. Y you've been several places along the Western front. I know Verdun, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the Somme, uh, Bellow Wood, um, Valqua, um, a lot of the places in the, um, Argonne forest. So yeah, I, I've pretty well, covered been to most of the big places on the western front at least once now even if it was just for a few hours uh, yeah. there's still a few like i've got to get to vimy ridge and a few other places still but i've covered quite a bit of it I, i've actually i put some books on my amazon wish list today talking about like the canadian role in, mm. in one i'm really going to dig into that and and educate myself uh because my my uh knowledge level excuse me, is, is only surface. When it, when it One of the things that I have been more and more understanding, especially after going to Ypres, is fairly certain the Canadians, pound for pound, might have been the best fighters on the Western Front. They were just unreal. Some of the, some of the battles they were involved in and some of the things they were able to accomplish, the Canadians uh, and the Australians in particular, uh, in and around Ypres, just amazing stuff. Just blows me away. It, if I'm not mistaken, I think that in 19, from 1917 to 1918, or maybe 1916 to 1918, the, the Canadians did not register a single loss in a battle. That doesn't surprise me a bit. I mean, they were the ones who, I mean, they were, you know, obviously Bimmy Ridge. They were the ones who held the gap uh, at Ypres when the gas attack happens in April of 1915. The first use, like mass use of poison gas on the Western Front. The Germans unleashed this chlorine gas in April of 1915, and the six-kilometer gap opens up in the line. And some I've, I've read some historians who argue, I don't know if I agree with them, some who argue that if the Germans had been able to exploit that, they could have won the war because they would have taken Ypres, they would have gone to the Channel, they would have had access to those ports, and who knows what might have happened. Uh, but it's the Canadians, it's a couple of battalions of Canadians who go in there and plug that gap and hold the line when everybody else, when the French and everybody else have fallen out. Um, and as the Canadians who uh, take the last 800 yards of Passchendaele, this slug fest uh, that costs, you know, maybe as many as three quarters of a million lives, and, uh, just ridiculous uh, stuff that they were able to accomplish. Uh, so, so Ypres, there, there's three major battles that were fought there, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, the weird thing is, like a lot of these places, those we have the three big battles, but those battles are really a bunch of battles. Just like you know, when we talk about a battle, like um, um, oh, what's the big tank battle on the west on the eastern front, in World War Two, with the Russians? Kursk. Uh, Kursk. Like Kursk, we call it a battle, but it was really like a campaign that involved a bunch of battles, like Prokhorovka, Prokhorovka, and things like that. So Ypres the same way. It, it's you know, it's just like 20 mile long front and you have these big battles, but some of these battles last three or four months. It's like Verdun. Verdun was almost a year, but we call yeah. it one big battle. But yeah, um, you've got the first battle of Ypres, which happens in the fall of 1914. And that's right about when 
they're starting to settle into trench warfare. It's right at the end of what they call the race to the sea, where they're yeah. trying to outflank each other until they run out of places to outflank each other. And then the uh, the Germans actually take the town of Ypres, but then they, they pull out. The British then come in. The French are on the north side. The British are on the south side. And you have some fighting, a couple hundred thousand casualties. I know we talk about these numbers like they're nothing, but yeah. in, in the grand scheme of things, they're not. Um, second battle of Ypres then is... Uh, spring of 1915 and that's when you have the gas attack and that's when you have the first use of mines at places like hill 60 uh and then the third battle of Ypres is the one we call passiondale which is the longest and the bloodiest of all of them and that's like july to november of 1917 there's other fighting and there's another battle that happens called the battle of the lease in the spring of 1918 but that's part of the, what we call the kaiser schlock defensive so it's like a much broader than just Eper at that point. But yeah, those are kind of the three big ones. Okay. All right. Now, when you're, are you two or three episodes in on this series? Uh, two. I'm getting ready to have, well, I, I mean, I had the, like the, the preview thing, but two episodes. Third one's going to be going live this weekend. Okay. And that's right. going to be uh, Essex Farm, which is, um, that's going to focus on spring of 1915, um, John McRae the Canadian who wrote uh, in Flanders fields. Yep. Um, so I'm, I visited the farm, uh, the, um, the cemetery and the, the what's called an advanced dressing station, which is like a hospital that he was working at. And that was where he wrote that poem after one of his buddies was killed. Uh, and it was said that he sat there right next to his buddy's grave while he, he kept looking over at the grave while he was writing the poem. So oh. I'm going to tell that story there. And then um, the Christmas truce after that. Okay. All right. So, so you didn't like parse it up to where, you're, you know, hitting like the, the, uh, for lack of a better term, like the first battle of Epiter and the second battle. of Ypres. So, yeah. So I, I thought about doing it that way. Um, and then I, you know, the, the issue with Epiter is, and this is not unique just to there, it's the Western front as a whole, any place you go on that battlefield, there were three or four battles fought in that exact same spot. You know, like, so like I went to Polygon Wood and I thought, OK, do I tell the story of each of like the five different battles that were fought here or do I just explore the battlefield and tell some individual stories? And so um, I do give some of the backgrounds like when I do the one about Passchendaele, I'll give the background about the Battle of Passchendaele, Third Epoch. But then I, I most of that video is taken up with t- talking about just the last two weeks of the battle when the Canadian first and second divisions made the final assault on Passchendaele Ridge, because big battles like that. I mean, there's just no way to really do it justice in a 15, 20 minute video. Um, So like Polygon Wood, I walked around that battlefield and I do, I tell like a little bit of a story from the first battle that was fought there, go and show some of the bunkers, talk about the third battle of Ypres and what was taught there. So yeah, I didn't really do it like in terms of telling the whole story of a battle. I just tried to, do little snapshots. Well, I, I think your original content, that's what you do really well. And, and I wish I did it as well as you did is telling like mining some of those stories um, and, and telling some of those more, more personal things. Um, yeah. Th- that's really. Yeah. I um the, the strength of your original content, just from my point of view. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And that's, it, that really kind of came about when I was putting together the plans for my first trip to when I went to the Western Front in France back in February is when I was trying to do all this research and I was just like overwhelmed by the scale of it all. Hmm. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to I'm just going to find some stories and tell some stories and, you know, maybe go at this from a different angle than people normally do. And people seem to really respond to it. So that's kind of become what I've done when I go to europe now yeah i i think it's awesome hey i had a question uh the the second episode that you did in the series um where you are looking at the at the lines and maybe you know the answer to this maybe you don't it's one thing that i was asking myself when i was watching it there's one part of the video where you go to where the french and british trench line was Mm -hmm. and then it looks like maybe 20 30 yards in front of it at, it at most the, yeah it is the uh i'm sorry the the german mm-hmm. so do, do you know how they got that close like had, had the germans taken over 
like the, the French line and like uh, the front line became the support line or the support line became the front line or how, how did they get, you know? I, I think it started that way or I think they, they did approach because, I mean, because we're talking, this is like December 1914 when those lines are there. This is the earliest days of trench warfare. So this is not, you know, I mean, trench warfare in that area around Ypres really only starts in like late October. Um, so I think that's just kind of where they ended up. And there are a lot of places it's even closer. And, you know, you go to places like Valcois, where I was back in February in France, and it's the same deal. You can um, you can see how close they are. And that's one of the reasons why they started developing trench mortars is because their artillery, they couldn't use their artillery because the, the lines were so close in some of these places. Um, I think, it, yeah, I think it just kind of started that way. And um, in that case, it didn't last very long that way because um, the British overran the Germans in February of that same year. And then the Germans overran them back in April. So it was very fluid there back and forth between those lines. So I think they did occupy each other's lines, but those initial starting places, I think that's where they first dug the trenches. Holy smokes, man. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, it's hard to believe when you stand there and see it, that you think they, they were really that close because a lot of places they weren't that close. You go down when you see where I did the, um, Christmas truce, which is the same time. That's December 1914. Uh, those lines are a couple hundred yards apart, and there's a yeah. big no man's land there. And I think that more often than not was how it was. Okay. Yeah, I, I had wondered if maybe there was some sort of situation where uh, people who aren't familiar with World War One trenches, there, there's, in general, three lines. You have your front line trench, mm -hmm. and then a support trench, and then you have your reserve trench. Yeah. And I wondered if maybe like the Germans moved in and took that frontline trench and then the support trench ended up becoming the frontline trench for yeah. the, the French or something like that. I don't know. I can't I can't 100 percent answer that for sure. But I'm guessing December 1914, you don't have those layers of trenches. That's something that develops as time goes on, because, you know, places like the Somme and Verdun, those lines are fairly static for a couple of years. I mean, yeah. um, like at, at the Somme, you go to places like Hawthorne Ridge and they had been in those trenches for almost two years before any attacks really are happening. Uh, so they've really built those up and that's when you get those multiple layers with the communication trenches in between and everything. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a pause here. Somebody had a super chat asking me if I'm going to go to Vicksburg at some point. And the answer is yes. Um, but until then, Chris actually has some original content that he did at Vicksburg. So <laughs> I'm going watching you, that. You definitely have to go there. I want to see the history underground treatment of Vicksburg. Plus, I want to see what you think <laughs> of that because it's an amazing battlefield. It's one of my favorites. I absolutely love it there. I'm just going to watch your stuff and plagiarize it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I did when I first did it? <laughs> I watched other people's stuff. That's, that's how we learn. So. Oh, oh, what what else? Uh, what else can we be expecting in, in this? Year? How many going to be 12 episodes uh, well, for, for Eper. So um, yeah, I can, I can kind of give you the rundown. We did, we've already done an intro kind of walking around the town, stuff like that. Uh, and then I did Hill 60, which actually was one of my last stops on that trip. Um, the crazy thing when you go there is you've got this vast battlefield where there are millions of casualties and everywhere I went with it was within about a 10 minute drive of my hotel. Um, not, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely nuts. And, and just the scale of that, and then understanding that these guys were fighting over the same ground for years. And so your buddy that was killed six months earlier, and still laying out there somewhere, now you're attacking over that ground, and you're going right past his decayed body. And I mean, of course, that was everywhere on the Western Front. But right. um, yeah, so anyway, um, so we did Hill 60, we're going to be doing Essex Farm, I talked about that, um, uh, visiting one of the sites that we absolutely 100% know for sure a Christmas truce happened because uh, we have firsthand accounts of it from a guy named Bruce Barron's father, who was a, um, a British uh, writer and um, artist. But um, And they've got a, a memorial there um, where people leave soccer balls, footballs for you know the rest of the world um, because that was one of the places we know that kind of thing happened. So talk about the Christmas truce there. Um, do a video about Passchendaele and the Canadian first and second divisions, their final attack. There's this just incredible spot where you stand at the Canadian Memorial and uh, 
you can see a church that's like 700 yards away and it took them 10 days to get there. Oh, um, yeah, it's just, oh, it's, it's ridiculous. And, um, so going to visit a place called the trench of death, uh, which is actually not part of the Ypres salient. It's a little bit North. It's about halfway between Ypres and Calais, um, or, or in Dunkirk, halfway between Ypres and Dunkirk. It's about 10, 12 miles from Dunkirk. Um, and it was the place where the Belgian army made their stand. And it was like the place where they stopped the German army um, and fought in this exact, this 300 yards of trenches that are preserved there uh, and fought there for, for four years. And they called it the trench of death because so many men died there on a daily basis in this one spot. So you say stopped them? Talking like race to the sea stopped them? Yeah, it was like when the race to the sea happened, it's right along the Iser River right there. Uh, okay. And... Um, right at the end of the trench of death, then is a about 50 yards away from the end of the trench is a German bunker. And that was where the Germans got across the river. But that was as far as they got because that bunker, like they couldn't, have, couldn't get past it. So you see the bunker and then you see the Belgian trenches and it's just an amazing, it's by far the biggest trench system preserves oh. that I've seen anywhere. It's incredible. Um, and I have to thank our friend, uh, Sander VK history for telling me that I needed to visit that one. So, um, I talked about Polygon Wood, which is an incredible site with a lot of history there and um, visited the cemetery in the middle of that. Um, did an episode about, um, there's a little town called Poppering, which is um, just outside of Ypres, west of Ypres. Uh, and that was where most of the um, British trials and executions of deserters took place. Oh, um, So I visited... Um, there were about 300 British and Commonwealth soldiers who were executed for desertion during the war. Uh, and about one in six of them were executed in that one town. Um, so I visited the cemetery where 17 of them are buried. That's by far the most in any one place. And then we actually, I visit the cells where they were held. Uh, and they're, they're actually a recreation of the pole that they were, they were shot at uh, right there in town. Um, so tell some of their, those guys stories. Most of those guys who were shot were, very clearly suffering from what we would call PTSD today. Um, I was, some of them. I, I listened to an episode of uh, the old front line and it, it was talking about different souls who were executed during the war and holy cow. Um, it, it's it, listening to some of those stories is absolutely heartbreaking. Cause like you say, mm-hmm. it, they weren't cowards. Um, no, no. In most cases, uh, the, the ones that, you know, I heard, it's like these guys were just wore out and just mm. emotionally and mentally broken. Like they, they needed it. Oh, and, and it's it's a miracle to me that anybody on the Western Front wasn't like that. Yeah. Um, just when you understand. I mean, I say this all the time, and I'm sure that at moments in history, there have been some really awful places to be, you know, Stalingrad, for example, or, you know, places like that. But pound for pound, the average experience of the soldier in World War One has to be the worst in history, like for the average soldier, like just the, the mass of men who experience just things that we can't even wrap our minds around. Um, and for any of them to come out, in any way saying is just a miracle to me. And yeah, like, you know, one of the stories that I tell in that is this guy, um, Eric Poole was his name and he was an officer and he was a volunteer. This guy signed up. He wasn't drafted. He volunteered, was on the front lines for a long time. He's at the battle of the Somme and he has an artillery shell hit real close to him that knocks him senseless and nearly buries him alive. And it's at that moment that he just kind of, he breaks and but he continues to serve and they put this guy in command of a platoon on the front lines at Ypres after that uh and then at some point he just goes out of his census ends up wandering around aimlessly everybody who encountered him said the guy had no idea what was even going on they had doctors testify that was the case his brigade division and corps commanders all said that this guy should not be executed for this and douglas Haig, the british commander signed off on it and wrote in his diary that day and said, listen, people need to understand that the, the law is going to be the same for an officer as it is for the common soldier. And he made an example of this guy and there was no business whatsoever. This guy should have been on the front lines. Wow. Um, so yeah, those are the stories I'll tell with that one. Um, going to visit Tynecott Cemetery, which is the largest 
British military cemetery anywhere on the planet. Uh, and it's there at Aper. Um, Menin Gate, probably the most emotional I got on this trip was visiting the Menin Gate, which is, uh, um, it's this huge gate that's on one end of the town that's got the names of 55,000 uh, like British and Commonwealth soldiers of British, Indian, Australian, Canadian uh, guys who were never found, who were never identified, who are either in unknown graves or still out in the field somewhere. Uh, and that's not even all of the missing from Ypres. It's just the ones they could fit up through August of 1917. The rest are at Tynecott on another memorial with another 35,000 names on it. Uh, and then every night, since the end of the war, they have been doing this ceremony called the last post, which is like their version of uh, taps. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it every single night. They gather at eight o'clock and there were probably a thousand people there the night that I was there. And they do this every single night. Uh, the only time they didn't do it every night was during the occupation of the Germans during World War Two. I was going to ask. The, about yeah. And the very day that the Polish forces liberated the town of Eper, they did it. And they've done it every day since. In fact, there was still fighting going on in the town, but enough, enough of it had been liberated that they started doing it again that day. And uh, from 1944 until today, they've done it every single day. Uh, incredibly emotional experience. I, I recorded the whole thing, so it'll be in that video. Um, and then I visited the Langemark German Cemetery, which um, has about 44,000 German soldiers buried in it. Most of them I think 25,000 of them are in a mass grave that is maybe 75 feet long and 30 feet wide. And there's 25,000 Germans buried in there. Um, so told some of the German stories when I was there. So that's, that's, I think pretty much all of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I've seen some people who have just jumped in the middle here. Uh, so we got Chris from vlogging through history. Uh, that's, we're talking a little bit of, World War One stuff, and then I also want to mention uh, I saw a super chat from Project Past earlier, um, and yeah, thanks for the super chat and the kind words. And anybody watching this, uh, definitely go check out Project Past channel. He, he's got some incredible stuff um, yep. that uh, it's it's one of my favorite channels. Uh, let's see, here's another super chat it says uh, thank you for keeping history alive, guys. What's the best place to see Rommel's planning? For the D-Day invasion, that's all you. That's your that's your wheelhouse now. <laughs> World War Two. Um, I'm not sure if I like that. That question could be taken a couple different ways. I, I don't know if you're talking about like a, a resource, like a book, to to see about his planning, or if you're talking about like a, a physical place. Um, and I kind of was wish Paul Woodage was on here. <laughs> Paul would be definitely be the guy. Um, there, there's a place, oh, crud, I can't remember the name of it just off the top of my head. I'm drawing a blank. My, my brain is in World War One mode right now. Um, but you, you can go see Rommel's headquarters uh, in, in France. Um, but yeah, and then as far as a book, hmm. Man, I would actually have to think about that as far as uh, a book. So, all right, I'm going to uh, switch gears here uh, a little bit. Uh, would I be stepping on any plans that you have if I ask you about uh, All Quiet on the Western Front? Um, I I'll talk about it a little bit, but yeah, I, I do have a video coming out about that. But uh, um, here's what I'll say about that. First of all, uh, we desperately need more good World War One content that shows that war the way it was. And from that standpoint, All Quiet on the Western Front does that. You watched it, didn't you? Did you see yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think it does a good job of showing that war, especially the beginning. You see the German soldiers all gung-ho, all excited to fight for their country. And then very soon you see what war really is. And uh, um, so if people are like looking for a great adaptation of the book, that's not it. It's kind of loosely based on the book. It's inspired by the book, but it's not the story from the book. It's it's got elements of it, but um, oh, and they needed the title. Yeah, to, yeah, I think yeah to to get people to watch the movie. But I hope we'll get more of that uh, kind of yeah. thing. And there, there's one scene that is in the book that I'm glad they included. And I'll, I'll talk about that one in particular. It's when 
Paul, the German soldier, uh, ends up in kind of a hand-to-hand fight in the in the uh, the, the artillery crater with the yeah. French soldier, and he and he stabs him. And then yeah. you see that whole scene where he, he's like begging his forgiveness, and he even says in French, he says, "Just, just we désolé, just we désolé," you know, just you know, I'm, I'm so sorry in French. And um, that that was so well acted and so beautifully portrayed what it must have been like for someone to take another human life up close like that for the first time who had never done anything like that before. And we forget these guys, these were not machines. These were not robots. These were human beings who we see that from the, the the, uh, Christmas truce in 1914, they were not in a default setting to want to kill their fellow man. It took, it took time to get them there. Um, so I'm glad they portrayed that. And uh, so I, I, I thought as a World War I movie, it was excellent. And I watched it in German um, with the subtitles because I'm trying to work on my German anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. I don't know. What did you think of it? I, I thought I thought it was it was really good. Um, Except for the historical inaccuracies, right? <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, even even in that, I mean, that, that didn't that didn't bother me. Um it, okay, so if I have to offer, let me start off by saying that I like the movie. So I, I, I don't want it to sound like I hated it. Compliment or, sandwich. You got to say something yeah. good before you say something negative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so here would be my criticisms. One, I had some trouble connecting with the characters. Mm. That, and, and maybe that's just because I'm a meathead. Um, but I, I had some of the similar problems connecting with the characters that I had the first time I watched the Pacific. Mm, yeah. And, and as soon as I got to the end of uh, this adaptation of all quiet on the Western front, I thought I need to watch that again. And I think that I'll like it better the next time around. Once I, you know, kind of connect with the characters or mm. um, um, like I was able to connect with, with Paul and then his, his friend, I can't remember his name. Um, in the movie, but, but some of the other characters, I, it it was a little weird to me. And the other thing that I kept struggling with through the entire movie is the, uh, the general who is like wanting to fight to the bitter end. Mm. I I kept trying to figure out who is this man? Uh, is this Ludendorff? Is it Hindenburg? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Who am I looking at? And then I I had to look it up again. Maybe this is just because I'm a meathead. Um, and then I find out, Oh, he's, not anybody he's just no yeah because i thought the same thing when i when i saw it i i thought it it had to be hindenburg but yeah no yeah um so so that would that would be my only two criticisms of the movie um but man as far as just depicting the the raw brutality of of the whole thing um I, I thought I thought it was outstanding, and I've seen some criticisms that it went a little bit too long, and there are areas where there's a lot of downtime and things mm. like that. To me, that that didn't bother me as much. No, yeah, it didn't bother me either. I, I think that's more reflective of reality. Um, that it's not just wall to wall fighting, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. That World War one, it's a lot of sitting around and just being bored, uh, yeah. and and everything. But yeah, I, I thought it was outstanding. I, I hope. I mean, I don't know. Uh, the reviews that I read have have all been positive. Um, I hope that it's enough of a success to get us more movies like it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind seeing a modern adaptation of uh, like the Alvin York story, um, mm-hmm. or you know, some you know other you know, maybe a Vimy Ridge or a- anything. Yeah. Uh, because man, World War One, I. I I love learning about it and hardly anybody knows anything about it. Yeah. When, when and I think part, part of that for us as Americans is because our country was so little involved compared to, I think Europe for, you know, in Europe, it's very different. Like I think in a lot of ways, world war one is as alive to them as world war two is for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see things like that with the, the ceremony at Ypres every night uh, and how just, after a hundred plus years, these people in Belgium who have really no real connection to these soldiers who fought there from the British empire come out in the hundreds every single night for this ceremony. Yeah. Um, so it's incredible. And yeah, you know, like, you know, I, I think people just don't realize the scale of it. Um, 
you know, I was thinking about like that men and gate and those are just a little more than half the missing, just the missing, not the dead, just the missing, just from the British army, just from the Ypres salient. And that's equal to the number of battle deaths the Americans had in the entire war. Um, so yeah, 55,000. So, I mean, it just, you know, we lost 55,000 battle deaths in the whole, in our whole participation in the war. Um, the British lost 20,000 dead in a couple hours at the Somme. So, you know, there's a lot more skin in the game for them in that war than it was for us. Yeah. And again, maybe, maybe we're just, you say kind of speaking more from an American viewpoint mm. uh, where it, it may not get the, the play and the attention here. Uh, that it does in, you know, Britain and the, the Commonwealth countries. I, I saw somebody, I can't even remember where I, I saw this, um, but there was a movie that came out about Gallipoli and mm. the American poster uh, said something about, you know, Gallipoli, uh, the story of uh, like the untold story of World War One or the, the, the story of World War One that you've never heard. And people well, in Australia, you've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> in New Zealand were like, how have you never heard of this story? Like this, this yep. is like the biggest, uh, you know, event for them, I yep. guess. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, that is their, they have Anzac day. I mean, that's like, yeah. like their Memorial day, uh, is the day that they landed at Gallipoli. Yeah. But I, I was thinking about this earlier. Cause I'm like, like I said, I'm kind of in a world war one mode right now. Um, and you know, I was thinking about how now, if you think about like World War II veterans, you know, they're kind of in, we're in the, the twilight years, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for our World War II veterans. Um, and you see stories about them taking trips to Europe and doing uh, like honor flights. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff about the, these World War II veterans in their final years. I mean, we're close to the same age. When, when you were a kid, do you remember seeing anything like that with World War I veterans? No. No. And I, I, mean, I honestly could not tell you if I ever remember knowing anybody who was a World War One veteran. And I know they were around because mm-hmm. um, the last one died in, I think, like 2011. So yeah, they were from, around, but I couldn't I uncle, couldn't tell you a single one I knew growing up. Yeah, I, me neither. Um, I, I saw one World War One veteran my freshman year of college. I went to a, um, a Veterans Day assembly that the college is putting on. And they had a World War One veteran there, and I, and I just like saw him on the stage, and that that was it. But as far as you know, any news stories about World War One veterans or seeing mm-hmm. anything, you know, about uh, you know celebrating them or anything like that, man, there was there was nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, that's that's I, I wish that there was more attention uh, that was that was put on yeah. it. Which I'm, I'm glad that you're doing. Your thing yeah, to- and I, I think that's part of why I gravitated to that was um, I just felt like there was a hole in our collective knowledge of that. And I just for me personally found myself wanting to learn more. And it, it's kind of become my rabbit hole that I regularly dive down into now. And um, I, I have to be careful, though, because when I when I do my research, I usually spend a couple of months doing research before I take one of these trips just to kind of lay out what I want to do. And it's a dark place that I go to when I start mm-hmm. digging into these stories. Um, I have to take breaks from it. And my wife even comments and says, listen, you need to, you need to step back from this for a little bit because it, it is depressing when you start studying these stories and, and realize what these guys went through. And it's not like, I don't know what it is that's different. I don't know if it's the, the nature or the needlessness, the senselessness of it all. Like in World War II, you know, when you're following the stories of guys like Easy Company, yes, it's awful and tragic that these guys died, but it felt like they were dying for something, right? Like, like at the end, you felt like their sacrifice, it meant something and it mattered. World War II just seems like a, a huge waste of 20 million lives with really nothing to show for it. Um, and so it, it is, it, it gets, it's very sad and depressing when I start studying it. So I, I take breaks from it when I can. Well, I mean, it seems like more people, I've seen some, some comments here talking about how there's more on World War II, more movies about World War II. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that you can fully understand World War II without understanding World War I. Um, so I've got a series that's coming up 
uh, it'd be at the beginning of the new year. Um, basically talking about we go to Southern Germany and a little bit into Austria and, and really it's hitting a lot of stuff with the, the rise of the, of Hitler and the third mm-hmm. Reich, And that's all tied into to world yeah. war one. Like people don't yeah. understand how Hitler rose to power, but if you understand what was happening in world war one and yep. how the felt and what was happening in the inner war years uh, right after mm-hmm. You look at it and you're like, okay, I, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I sure as heck understand it. Yep, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and and actually, I almost did a story on Hitler because he spent a lot of his early time in the war in April. And oh, uh, really? I, I, one of my videos, you'll actually hear me quote from Mein Kampf because he, in Mein Kampf, he describes one of the battles where I visited and did a thing on. So I, I used one of his descriptions of that battle. Interesting. I uh, had another super chat here from Dean it says, if both of you had one question for a world war one vet, what would it be? And why? Hmm. I'll let you go first. I've been talking a lot. So, man, I don't know. Um, I, I think that I would want to sit down with my camera and hit record and just say, start from the beginning and yeah. tell me, um, cause I, I guess, I guess if I had to narrow that, that's, that's not answering the question though. That's taking the easy way out. Um, I, I would probably want to have him describe to me. Well, depends on if you're asking an American or a, <laughs> experience is a little bit different there. Yeah. Um, but but assuming it's like a, a British guy fighting in the psalm or something like that, um, I would I would want to know w- what is it like charging across mm. that man's land, um, and, and just kind of describe what what that whole process looks like, um, you know, from from beginning to end, um, or maybe what it looks like if you get into the enemy trenches because that's when it mm. gets exceptionally yep. ugly. So, I don't know. You you spent more time with this I than me. My question would be: I think it'd probably be really simple. How'd you get through it? What 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 did you do to cope? Like not only those moments of extreme terror like that, but the in between. You know the you know to be a French soldier on the opening day of the Battle of Verdun, mm-hmm. and to have endured that artillery barrage. And you know I, I was looking at a a statistic today because you know you hear a number like two million shells fired you know in two days or whatever you know like you know there was one section was a thousand yards wide and 500 yards deep so we're talking what a little over a half a mile wide maybe a third of a mile deep in one day 24 hours eighty thousand artillery shells hit that section of the front at verdun eighty thousand in an area a half a mile wide and a third of a mile deep. Um, wow. And these weren't all just like eight and nine inch shells. Some of these were like 420 millimeter shells. They're like naval gun shells that are, you know, launched from 20 miles away and just incessant. And I, I don't know how, and, and a lot of times, like there's a story I tell in um, Polygon Wood at uh, Ypres where they came across a bunker with 14 dead Germans in it, not a mark on any of them they had been killed by the concussion from an artillery shell that had landed nearby. Wow. Well, I kind of tying into, to that original question. Um, what I would want to, what I would want probably eh, maybe more, um, than interviewing a world war one veteran is to have modern, uh, video technology, in, in mm. world like you're talking about Verdun there there are accounts of soldiers watching that opening barrage and standing there and watching a forest disappear now there there's no other war world war ii or anything like that, there's no other war that does that mm-hmm. where where you can stand there and just watch this this old growth forest disappear before your eyes uh, just from the artillery barrage. I, I want to know what that looks like and what that sounds mm. like. Yeah. Uh, Somebody asked a question, um, a recommendation. 
best book over on the whole war for me personally would be there's one called the a world undone um if you want a book that covers the entire world war one that i think was really really well done and that was the book that really got me into world war one uh, is that and by, i know like is that what is that by peter hart uh i don't think let me see or is that one, or is that one called the G- great war gj meyer gj meyer world undone um but it's uh, it, it's like insanely long, but it's it's really really good. And um, I know the the Great War Channel, the one that does like the week by week of the war, they often use a World Undone um, in their material uh, and covering the war. It's really good. Uh, and Dan, yeah, somebody said Dan Carlin's podcast, excellent. If you wanna, if you don't want like details of every single battle, but you just want to know more, what was World War One like? Dan Carlin's podcast is phenomenal on World War One. Um, his series on World War One. I, I, I mean, I've liked everything that he's ever done. Um, yeah. So it's to to me, he hasn't done anything that I've been like, oh, that wasn't very mm. good. I, I thought it's all great. That was his his Fifth Symphony. I mean, that, that to mm. me, that that is his best work. Um, yeah. yeah. And and it's one of those things. I think he'll always do good work. I don't know if it'll ever to me uh, be better mm. than. His stuff on Stalingrad was... I haven't done that one yet. I've done um, uh, the one Supernova in the East about the Japanese mm-hmm. in the Pacific. Yep. I've done the ones on the Celtic Holocaust, which was excellent. And then the World War One. Those are the ones I've done so far. I'll, I'll let you tackle this question. Somebody asked, does uh, 1917, the movie, do World War One justice? It's too clean. It's way too clean. It's too green. Uh, World War One by 1917 looked like the moon anywhere that there was any fighting it was just black no trees and everything there looked like it had just been built a week before um i I like 1917 as a movie um but it doesn't really accurately portray how horrible that war was so if you want that all quiet on the western front does a much better job of it yeah i i would now that I've had time to to let all quiet on the Western front kind of settle and simmer and everything like that, I, I would almost go as far as to say that's the best World War One movie that's ever been made. Yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of competition. But there's not a whole lot of competition. Yeah. Uh, and there are yeah. good there are good shows that like tell stories from World War One well, like um, um, the Beneath Hill sixty. Uh, it's not a real high end, high budget production. Um, but Beneath Hill 60 does a good job of telling, you know, telling that part of the story from the Ypres salient. Um, but it's not like on the level of all quiet on the Western front, as far as the, the money and the, the work that they put into it. I, I like 1917 when, when it gets to the, the end and yeah, they're, they're charging across this green field. Um, part of me wondered, and, and they've got like the, like these chalk trenches and, and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do wonder like where that's supposed to be depicting the, the I bat. think, I, I think, I mean, just given the information that they share where they talk about how the Germans are gone, uh, it's gotta be them falling back to the Hindenburg line, which they did. The, the Germans in 1917, like 40 miles back from their front lines, they build this whole new line of fortifications and then they fall back because it allows them to shorten their lines. And so that's why even when I was saying just now about how green everything was, the only hesitation I would give is the fact that, OK, if that's what they're portraying as the Hindenburg line, well, there wasn't a lot of fighting that had happened there yet at that point in 1917 because they fell back to that position. OK. All right. One thing that I, I loved about 1917 is just how it was shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, cinematography of that movie is insanely good. The, the scene after... Um, I, I can't remember the main character's name, but um, after he goes into that house and, and he gets knocked out. So it's kind of like at the midpoint in the movie mm. where, where he goes out and he's going amongst those buildings and there are these flares that are going. Mm. There's just like this movement of light uh, with the, the music and everything. Uh, that That is one of the best pieces of cinema that... Mm. I think I've ever seen. I, I personally, I loved that scene. Uh, and I think, I think they intentionally wanted to do that. Cause I read somewhere that this is going to be 
uh, Germany's entry into the like the foreign language category for the Oscars this year. Uh, so they they were like making this movie to be a cinematic masterpiece. Like that was their one of their goals with it. So oh, seventeen. Oh, 1917. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I know, I know what part you're talking about. That is, it, it is really, and it is shot really cool. And some of the scenes, like the one with him going into the bridge, and and yeah, and then discovering that town that's all kind of burnt out and at night. Yeah, that's all really well done. Yeah, uh, that I mean, it is. It, it's like a, a ballet. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just loved it. Um, but, but yeah, I I, I hope that. Um, I hope that all quiet on the Western front gets, gets its proper due. Mm-hmm. Um, so all right, we're, we're approaching an hour here. Um, I, I know what you've got coming up next as far as like travel and, and things like that. What, uh, well, maybe I should open it up to questions first. Maybe if anybody has any questions, hang on, here's a super chat here. Uh, it says, have either of you read with the old breed by Eugene sledge, hands down one of the most incredible war memoirs, of all time. Uh, yeah, I've read it and I would venture to say it's my favorite book. Ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you read it? No, but it's on my list and I've heard a lot of people say that it's one of their favorites, uh, as far as memoirs go. And, uh, Eugene's daughter-in-law sent me a friend request on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. So I <laughs> guess I better go ahead and read that one. So, <laughs> Yeah, uh, Peleliu is, is pretty high on my list of places to visit, and and it's because of Sledge's book. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, here's another one. I'll, I'll direct this one to you. It says, "Do you think that the Lost Battalion is a better picture?" Whoops, I lost it. Is a better. Oh yeah, picture. to represent World War One than 1917. Yeah, uh, and it's a pretty accurate movie too. And I've been to that spot. Uh, in the Argonne Forest, I was going to make a move or make a video there on my first trip to France. Um, and I I had my my information, my, like my notes for what I was going to talk about uh, saved on a document in Google Docs. And I hadn't downloaded it to my phone. And that was the one and only place I completely lost my cell phone signal was when I got to the Lost Battalion site. So I couldn't pull up any of the information. Um, but you know, you park there and then you have to walk down basically like a cliff uh, down to the bottom to get down to where those guys were. I am going to go back there. Um, yeah, that's a very good movie. Um, I'm glad now that I can call one of the actors in that movie a friend, Phil McKee, um, who played Colonel Strayer in uh, Band of Brothers. Yeah. Uh, he plays Captain McMurtry in The Lost Battalion. Um, and uh, we talked a lot about that when I was with him in Belgium a few weeks ago. Um, about that movie. I think it's really good. It, it, it does a really good job of portraying that story um, pretty accurately. So it's one of my favorite, uh, personally, one of my favorite World War One movies. Okay. How, how would you square it up against 1917? Oh, it's much better than, I mean, 1917 is a, is a visual kind of c- cinematic masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Um, but I... This is just my own personal feelings. I tend to shy away from fictional stories. I, I prefer the real life ones. So I'll take a Lost Battalion movie that doesn't look as pretty, but tells a real story that really happened over 1917, which might be set in a real time period, but is a largely fictional story. Probably the same reason why, and this might be blasphemy, after you get past the opening 20 minutes, I'm not really a huge fan of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, probably for the same reasons. I, I like Saving Private Ryan as a movie. Um, I, I even have problems during the first 20 minutes. Like I, mm-hmm. I have to, I have to divorce myself from reality. Um, you know, e- even during that. Yeah. See, that, you know a lot more about that than I do. So I, I can see, I can understand that. Yeah. Uh, somebody else, uh, history savior, 1941 asked favorite battle to study in, uh, world war one. Um, the song. The song? Um, yeah. Uh, th- th- there's something about each one of them that hits me differently, but there was just something about the psalm now that I've been there that I'm really drawn to. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. I-, I really couldn't put my finger on it. Um, I will say, having visited all the sites, the one that that you feel the most physically and really hits you the most visiting is Verdun. Verdun might be the saddest place I've ever been in my life. 
um, and you physically feel that like it just you you just can tell what happened there when you go there and I've never I've never felt that as strongly anywhere else in my life the closest probably after that would be standing on the spot where the June 3rd attack happened during the Battle of Cold Harbor that that disastrous Union attack where like 5,000 guys go down in 20 minutes um, I, I felt that there in that one little spot but Verdun is like the death it's it's there it's still there and it's uh, it's hard to describe without actually being there yeah i i would say i'm of all the battles the the one that it, that i'm drawn to the most i would be verdun um i mean just the just the name operation judgment uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> where where the goal is we are going to dump everything that we have into this area. Um, and I, I believe it was Falcon Hines said, we're going to bleed them white. Yep. Yep. I mean, there, there is, there, there's, there, a, there's a darkness to, there is, there's a shift in strategy and mindset that happens at the beginning of 1916 with Verdun. It's gone from how do we break through their lines and win this war? militarily by movement and you know breakthroughs and you know to now how do we kill so many of them that they give up fighting yeah yeah there there's there's just something dark uh about about that battle um and, and when i when i read it um it, even though he wasn't in in this sector uh i i think mordor <laughs> and yeah. you know that that's how that's how what's his name describes it. Dan Carlin describes it that way. He describes Verdun as Mordor. Yeah. So I mm-hmm. I, I get Tolkien's imagery um, when mm-hmm. read about about Verdun. Um, I mean, it, 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 there's like I said, there's there's just a darkness about it that um, that I'm kind of drawn to. I, I don't know. That might sound kind of twisted, but. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, to me, uh, I, you know, I did that video from Duamont Ossuary there. Um, you know, the uh, where they've got the the bones of something like one hundred and ten thousand men in these little rooms, and uh, you know, I'd seen images of it. I had, I knew exactly what I was getting into. I walk up to that building. I get because you can't see in the windows from a distance. You have to get up really close to be able to see in them. I got about three feet away from the window, and everything within me just froze. And I suddenly thought, I don't know if I want to do this, um, you know, to look in and, and be staring face to face at the skull of a man who died in that war. Um, there was just something so real about it. And, and going right down the street to Fleury, which was one of those villages, they say, that died for France, um, yeah. you know, that has just been obliterated. And there's just shell holes everywhere. And anywhere you go in Verdun, they're just evidence of what happened there. It's just, it's amazing. And can, you almost, you, you did go there, didn't you? And you just didn't get a chance to see what, see anything. So my trip to Verdun was one of the most heartbreaking of all of the, so like stupid things happened to me. If people, I have people all the time say, Hey, I would like to, you know, join you on a trip or, you know, go the, I, nothing but dumb stuff happens to me. And then you get to see <laughs> best of everything on, on the channel. But yeah, I was, I was coming through Belgium, um, and was going to Normandy because I had to switch my plans up and reorient the whole trip because like the largest storm that had hit Normandy, I, like since 1944 hit the, the week that I was there. Um, so anyway, I, uh, that was in February. Um, and in people who haven't been to, I'm going to say France in particular, I don't want to say Europe in general, um, in, in the off season, it's, it's, it's weird being over there as an American because everything shuts down. Um, and like, as soon as it gets dark, Mm -hmm. the day's over, I'm talking gas stations, restaurants, everything in the off season, they're, they're just done. Uh, they're going home. Um, so I didn't know that. And we were traveling back through 
And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, we'll you know, roll into our hotel at eight o'clock at night and settle down and go to Verdun and to the battlefield the next day. Uh, got there and the hotel was locked up. Like I, I couldn't get in uh, to, you know, get a hotel room. I tried to call on a phone there. The person was less than helpful. And on top of that, my credit card merchant wasn't working in that mm. area. So, um, yeah, long story short, I've already told too long of a story anyway, because this is nobody cares about this. But anyway, um, yeah, ended up having to, to leave Verdun and uh, just put that off till another day. The good part was I got to go to Reims and, you know, go to the Surrender Museum. And, oh, and yeah, I remember that video. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, so that so so there was some good that came out of it, but man, I I wanted to go there so bad, mm. and I'm thinking about next summer. Um, oh yeah, making it's incredible the the forts there that you know like Fort Duamont, Fort Vaux are these massive. I mean, yeah, yeah. If you you and I have been to like forts like you know Civil War forts and things like that, I mean, <laughs> those got nothing. I mean, dude, Fort Duamont, you just go down and. And, you know, just go on and on and on. And it's massive. It's all underground. It's all preserved. Incredible stuff. But um, Verdun's a beautiful city to walk around. But, yeah, and the reason that whole story came up between you and me is because I had a similar experience at the Somme uh, <laughs> where I showed up and nobody was at my hotel that I was supposed to stay in <laughs> the night that I was supposed I was supposed to be speaking to uh, one of your classes. And oh, you know, yeah. I couldn't because I, I couldn't get into a hotel to get Internet. I just saw somebody ask, they said surrender museum question mark. Um, so in, in Reims, um, this was where Eisenhower's headquarters was. And in world war two, there's technically two surrenders that, mm-hmm. that take, um, but, but the first one where the, the Germans surrendered, uh, was in Reims. So I, there's a video you can go on the channel and, and find it. Um, I forget what the name of that episode was, but um, anyway, go go to the room where the the surrender took place. So anyway, that's that's what I'm referring to there. Somebody somebody said that all we need now is for Gary from the American Battlefield Trust to pop in as a surprise guest. We don't have room for his arms. In this video. <laughs> Oh it's, yeah. It's funny because I, and I think I, I commented to somebody about that one time. Somebody was commenting about his arms and I have a behind the scenes footage where I'm I'm standing behind you where you're recording him about to talk. And he has his arms are perfectly at his side. And the second he starts speaking, they get going. And it's just they're they're connected to his mouth. It's just a part of <laughs> who he is. And that's just, you know, kind of indicative of the energy that he has when he gets talking about the civil yeah. war and he gets excited about it. That's just who he is. And it's and great. I, we love it. I, I had some, uh, well, two things. I had somebody comment, you know, that the guy in the blue shirt needs to stop moving arms so much. I replied, render him mute. Uh, like he, he would not yep. be able to talk. And, and I had somebody else ask, is, is Gary the same in real life as he is on camera? And yeah, hundred yeah. percent. He's, totally. he's one of my people. He's, he's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Somebody just ask, um, uh, Hang on a second. Uh, super chat from Dean. Thank you for that. It says, what does it feel like to be in the foxholes for easy company? The video that got me watching your channel. Um, so I know, I know that you've been there. I'll let you tackle that one first. Well, um, very different experiences in my two times that I've been there this year. And you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, first, time, first of all, it's amazing. And I had, I had like a lot of people, lived vicariously through your video going there because you know you had been there and jd was great because i think it was like the night before i left for that trip uh you and i got on a video chat and you were like walking me around on the map showing me some of the spots and um that i needed to be aware of with that and it's amazing and it looks i mean exactly how you expect it that and the crossroads up in netherlands and the netherlands look exact excuse me exactly like they do in the in the series um it's everything you expect um and uh you know i think they've dug them out more to kind of make them look a little more like they did then and and you can go exactly to the one where um uh smoky gordon was when he cocked his machine gun and he got hit and paralyzed like we know exactly which one that is and um i've actually now um reg uh who was our tour guide the last time i went showed me exactly where um Toy and Garnier lost their legs, the exact spot where that happened. We found the exact 
location where uh, Winter's CP was um, mm-hmm. because we knew it was in that clearing, but they told us there were six foxholes that kind of were dug around that CP and we found the foxholes. So we oh. went and actually stood in the exact spot. I'll show you where it is. Uh, <laughs> but we stood in the exact spot where his CP was in that clearing. Um, so it's really, really cool, especially going there with somebody who knows where all those little things were. He actually was there with with Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron, and they showed uh-huh. him all these spots. Reg did. You know, so Reg showed that to us. So we went to the exact spot where Julian was shot in the neck uh, and killed uh, on the patrol which is back closer to where the monument is that has all the names of the dead on it. It's real Mm -hmm. close to there is where he was shot. Um, But yeah, but yeah, now, now they got a fence built around the whole thing and they've got a gate that you have to have a ticket in order to get in. Um, So the fence had been built when I was there the first time, but the second time when I was just there a few weeks ago, uh, yeah, now you have to have a ticket to the Bastogne War Museum to get in to the Bois Jack. Uh, you can walk around a lot of other places, but Operations Room is here. That's very cool. One of my hey. favorite channels. Love that channel. Operations Room, that his stuff is top notch. Speaking of Easy Company, if you want to see like some of their stuff on, you know, like uh, uh, the a couple of the Easy Company battles, Karen Tan, they do, um, they do the um, the the battle Breakcore Manor. They do that one. Excellent stuff. The Crossroads. Yeah, anybody who is watching this right now, uh, which looks like there's quite a few people in here, as soon as this live stream ends, go to the operations room and subscribe because holy 100%. folks, it's good. Um, Definitely, it is. It is darn good. Um, yeah, I, I've really been enjoying the the recent recent content coming out. But yeah, the the whole thing with that fence, I, I didn't know about the ticket. Uh, haven't had That's that. New. Yeah. So there, there's part of me that's thankful and part of me that feels guilty that I got to do what I did when I did um, and, and, and go see that place before that happened. Um, because, you know, I'll, I'll have the video and have the memories and, and can look back on it when it was still, uh, I guess, a little bit more pure. Mm. The same thing happened to me, and again, I, I feel guilty about it, but I also feel thankful uh, with Point de Hawk. Mm. But yeah, Operations Room, excellent guest narrators on the Bold series. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, Operations Room, uh, send, send me an email uh, with some of the stuff that we talked about because <laughs> I still need a script. <laughs> but anyway, um, right after I went, I went to Point du Hawk before they went in and put up the baby rails, mm. uh, the, the fences and, and everything like that. You, when I was there the first two times, you could like go down to the craters and, and it was a little bit more wild. And um, it's, it's unfortunate what they've done there. And there, I, I'm sure that I'll, I, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm positive. I know for a fact that I'm going to be going back to the, the Bois Jacques and, and everything, or uh, as I said it in the videos, the Bois Jacques. Um, <laughs> and, and there's, there's a part of me that doesn't want to go though, because mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I want to remember how it was. <laughs> so, so we didn't on our tour that I was on a couple of weeks ago with the guys from band of brothers, we didn't go in because we didn't have the tickets. So we walked all around the fence because there's still a lot you can walk around. You can still yeah. see foxholes. Like you can see the F company foxholes really well and things like that, but you just can't go. It's just the, the spot where easy company was on that corner there. So uh, is it, they've got fenced off. Is it completely boxed in? Yeah, it's boxed in on all sides, all four sides, all four sides. Gosh, yeah. dang. And it's just the easy company area that they've got boxed in with the fence. What a bunch of losers. That makes me so mad. I I try not to be critical of the decisions that other people make. Um, but that one, yeah, that's that's just a horrible move. But anyway, oh well. Uh, so, hey, what, what, what do you got uh, we got coming up next? We'll, we'll kind of start wrapping this up. Okay. Uh, um, well, let's see. Uh, keeping us cold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th- this little jaunt down to West Virginia is my last uh, anywhere I'm going this year. But uh, 
Yeah, uh, end of January, back to Belgium again. Um, haven't decided yet what the rest of that trip's going to look like because we're going back to Bastogne, but we're going to okay. be seeing some different sites associated with the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, excited about this one because uh, we're not only going to have Matt Leach with us again, who played Talbert in um, Band of Brothers, but uh, the woman who played the French nurse in those episodes. Oh, uh, she's going to be with us uh, for that. And there's one more they haven't announced yet. I have my suspicions that it's probably Shane Taylor who played Doc Rowe, but I, they haven't confirmed it yet. Okay. But I think, yeah, there's going to be. And then um, uh, Doug Allen, who played Al- Alton Moore, is going to be with us as well for that one. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, and I, I'm, I'm told we're doing some like unique experiences this time. Like I think there's going to be something involving us actually going out into the foxholes in the dark before daylight and watching the sun come up. And oh, kind of wow. a, it's like so so they're kind of planning some of those experiences like that. But I may uh, since that's just a two day tour out of Bastogne. I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do with the rest of my week there because I'm not going to go all the way to Europe and only go for the weekend. I'm going to go for a week. So. Right. Um, I might be going to the UK, um, fly into London, do some history content, and then take the train across the channel uh, over to Bastogne. Um, so I may be doing some things like I might go to um, uh, the Battle of Hastings and do the battlefield there. Um, might visit the uh, some sites in London that I haven't gotten to yet, like the uh, HMS Belfast, which is the last remaining uh, British warship afloat from World War II. Okay. Um, and I might go even go up to places up in the north and try to do things like um, some of the Wars of the Roses stuff. But we'll see. I haven't decided yet what I'm doing with the rest of that trip. What about you? Um, so I've got, as far as stuff on, on the channel, uh, hang on, I'm going to pause your question here for just a second. I got a super chat from Jeremy Scott that I want to uh, hmm. address. It says, have you thought about doing a video on the second Rangers and the attack on Hill 400? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a series that I've, I'm working on for the future where, where I'm going to go and, um, kind of get into to that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, as far as stuff on the channel, what's going to carry us through the rest of the year is revolutionary war content. So I've got the, the first couple of episodes, uh, that I've run right now. Um, if you haven't seen it already, They've kind of had a little bit of a flat start, but maybe that's just the time of year or maybe, I don't know. Maybe people get tired of looking at me after a while, um, but it had Boston Tea Party and Boston Massacre, but also going to be hitting Old North Church. Uh, and then I took Lexington and Concord and split it up into three different. Mm. Um, so it's going to be Lexington, Concord, and then the Battle Road. Um, mm, yeah. The, the British at all. Really up. cool stuff to see there, isn't there? Uh, it's, it's, there's a loved, lot there. Yeah, loved it. Uh, except for the problem was I went at the wrong time of year. I went just after. When was that? I went the first week of November, which was absolutely crazy for me because that's right in the middle of the rut here where I live. Uh, which um, it's like bow hunting and deer hunting. Mm. But anyway, everything was closed, so I, I didn't get to film nearly as much as what I wanted, um, and then did some cemetery stuff. Anyway, then the first of the year, I uh, got a ton of content from um, Bavaria, so a lot of stuff. Mm. In, um, and then we go down to Birch's Garden, be going up to the Eagle's Nest, um, and then we go down into to Austria a little bit, but there, there'll be a lot of stuff from there. Um, as far as where I'm traveling next, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I am, uh, I am a man without a plan right now. <laughs> <laughs> For so. me, long term, like in 2023, I don't have firm details yet, but some things I definitely want to do. I've been working on my German lessons for a reason, so uh, Germany and or Austria is probably coming in 2023 at some point. Um, but uh, for sure, domestically. Uh, little big horns at the top of my list. I want to get out to that site uh, yeah. and do some content there. Uh, I want to do a whole series on the Battle of Shiloh. I've been to Shiloh, had a couple hours there, but that's a battle I really want to dive into big time. And while I'm at it, I'll probably do, I know you've been to Fort Donaldson. That's a mm-hmm. site I want to get to as well. And uh, 
at some point I need to get back to Chickamauga and do a whole series there. Cause there's a lot, a lot of stories to be told from Chickamauga. Yeah. I, um, yeah, as far as 2023, um, I'm, I'm planning on getting back over to France. I would like to link up with Paul Woodage and, and do some stuff like inland at Normandy and kind of get off the beach. Uh, cause that, that doesn't get near enough attention. Uh, like I said, I want to get to Verdun. Um, I've thought about like trying to go to Greece and, and do Ooh. some, nice. uh, because I mean, that's, that's something I'm always wanting to kind of challenge myself and learn new things. That's what and, world war one started as for me. So now you see what it's done to me. Hey, I watch my channel. I'm, I'm pretty much a, <laughs> Civil War and World War Two is you would think that I'm not interested in anything else than that, but um, but anyway, uh, okay, one last maybe we'll take a few more questions here and then and then duck out. Uh, something oh, crud, what was that question about the Zulu? Well, I war? see Michael's got one, yeah, asking about Zulu War is Anne Luana and Rourke's Drift. I would absolutely love to get to South Africa and do battle. Uh, do do videos about those. I don't know if it'll ever happen. You've been to Africa, haven't you? Yeah, but it wasn't history. I was down there hunting. Yeah. So, I was I was down there hunting kudu and stuff like that, and that, that's been a while back. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I would love I, I would love. I'm fascinated by both of those battles. Um, yeah, I would love to. There is a channel that has some great content from those battlefields. Um, and while you're talking, I'm gonna look it up. So. Yeah, somebody asked about Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. I haven't, I haven't been to Berlin. That's another place that's, that's very high on my list uh, of places to go. As far as domestic stuff, um, this next year, I've, I've been to Shiloh before, so I've, I've thought about going and, um, you know, shooting some content at Shiloh. I saw somebody just mention Real History. Uh, I'm looking at, kind of doing some collaborations with Real History as well. Uh, and I also need to get to Ohio and do a bunch of presidential graves up there. So I know a guy <laughs> and I was thinking that's going to be another opportunity for uh, a collaboration. Cause I know you're, uh, I, I I'm into presidential history. I like learning about the leadership, but, uh, when it comes to presidents, I, I don't have anything on you. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, somebody else said something about us needing to do a collab at, uh, Spotsylvania, believe it or not, that is that is the biggest Civil War battlefield I haven't been to yet. The Spotsylvania, I've been all around it. I've been to Richmond, I've been to Petersburg, I've been to Fredericksburg, Wilderness, Chancellorsville. Haven't been to Spotsylvania, and it's right there. I I went to Spotsylvania years ago, and when I say years ago, I'm talking years and years ago uh, with Gary Gallagher, kind of kind of leading things, um, and that was that was before I knew as much about the civil war. Not that I know a whole lot. Uh, there's mo- most people know more than I do. Um, but, but my depth of knowledge at that time was pretty shallow and I, I wish that I would have known more, but uh, yeah, that, that was, that's pretty amazing being there. Being you there. mentioned real history. Is that, that's the guy that uh, wrote the book on Spears. Yes. Yeah. Him yes. And- okay. Yeah. I, I just talked to him a few weeks ago. He sent me a friend request on Facebook. We were talking a little bit. Um, he, I'm going to connect with him at some point too. Yeah. He, he co-authored Hang Tough and mm-hmm. uh, Valor with, with Eric Dorr. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody just said something that they would like to see some content on the Eastern front, but it can see why that's a no go. Yeah. I'd like to get there too. And actually Sander and I were talking when I was out there with him, um, about wanting to go to Auschwitz together. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I think I'll wait until maybe things calm down a little bit more over there. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I would go, but. Um, yeah, I, I know you've been there, but uh, yeah, but that's that's high on my list. And that's, um, have you been to Auschwitz? You've been there, haven't you? Oh, you haven't? Because I know you've no, been to Poland. Yeah, so when I was in Poland, I mean, obviously we, we were there to work, but we had a few days in Krakow. Um, just because we had to get a COVID test and had to wait for, you know, a certain amount of time. So we had like a day in Krakow, but I went to the Plaschow concentration camp mm. that's depicted in, um, uh, Schindler's list. Um, but yeah, there, there was just, 
there was just no time, um, you know, on, on that trip. Um, but, but yeah, I, I would love to, you know, get out to the, to the Eastern front and, you know, one, one of these days things will settle down mm-hmm. and, you know, all the stuff that's going on is, is going to pass. And, and I would love to get into Russia and, uh, you know, see, see a whole bunch of stuff there. So Jason, um, I was just in Setauket, um, a couple months ago, um, uh, visited Abraham Woodhull's grave when I was there. Uh, he's, it's to talk. It's actually super close to where speaking of presidential graves, um, it's just down the road from where, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's buried. They're real close to each other there. So, um, huh. yeah, I've actually got some un, unused footage about the Culper ring. Uh, I made a video about that. That's just one of my vid- many videos I haven't edited and uploaded yet <laughs> you had did did you upload everything that you shot at antietam no i've got like four more videos from there i've got five or six videos from my first trip to france that i haven't finished yet like bellow wood um, i've got several from the netherlands that i haven't done yet um, i've probably <laughs> got enough content to keep me busy for the next year with editing if i would just take the time to do it but i keep going on new trips and shooting more footage. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Hey, I'm going to hop off of here, uh, and take away your not editing, uh, <laughs> so you can put together a few more things. Uh, but Hey, uh, everybody that jumped in, um, uh, Hey, it was, it was good. Sorry that we didn't maybe get to all the questions. Um, we, we may have to do this more often. This is, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll have you at my place next time on, uh, on my channel and uh, we can do the same thing and let you yep. talk about world war two a bunch or something. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, well, Hey, have a, have a good trip out there to West Virginia and get back. Safe. All right. Take care. See Thanks ya. everyone. Now I got to figure out how to turn this off. All right, here we go. All right. See you everybody.